it is recording. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, sorry about earlier. Uh, I have no idea why my computer was being so, so, um, anyways, uh, my computer crashed during lecture. You probably saw that. I apologize for that. I have no idea why, um, but it seems to be fixed now, it seems to at least be stable. So uh, recording the, the lecture now, and um, I, again, I apologize for that. So uh, here gonna, I'm going to cover the rest of the study guide that we didn't go through uh, last class. And uh, hopefully, if you guys ha uh, if you guys have any questions, you know, just just let me know. Just uh, you can send me an email. So, all right. So uh, we're looking at the study guide. Let's go ahead and scroll down to where we were before. Um, and you know, because because the, my computer did this, I'm just going to go through the the rest of everything that that was on the study guide. So, uh, so before we finished question seven on our last lecture, so I'm uh, going to start on question eight here. Question eight: Define accuracy and precision. So, if you recall, accuracy and precision uh, is when we are dealing with uh, comparing. Uh, measurements. Although we can talk about accuracy and precision as it as it relates to a single um, to a single measurement, oftentimes we'll use it for comparing measurements. So uh, let's go ahead and go to our digital paper here and let me adjust where I need to be here. Okay, so question eight, accuracy versus precision. So accuracy is how close a measurement is to the true value. So the true value of whatever we are measuring. Um, the closer it is to that true value, the, clo the higher the accuracy. The farther away it is, the less the accuracy. And precision is how much detail a measurement has. And uh, more detail, which as we just the discussed in class, uh, smaller possible measure uh, measurements. Poss let's uh, phrase it that way. So smaller possible measurements uh, means a more precise measurement. Because the smaller the possible um, measurement in something, like take for example, if we're talking about length, um, something that we could measure in inches is much more accurate. Uh, sorry, much more precise than something we measure in feet. So um, that is what we had there. Now uh, we also had a an example when we we're going through this. Uh, let me get the page number correct for you guys. So this was section 3C. If you go to the uh, the exercises in the back, um, page 165 in the textbook, problems 51 through 54 detail uh, accuracy versus precision in comparing two measurements. Uh, and so I'm not going to uh, write this out in detail like I did with the, uh, with the examples we did in class. Uh, just be aware that it'll be similar to those those questions, but one of the examples or, or uh, an example similar to what we had in class uh, with uh, precision and accuracy was the following. Um, so let's suppose that we had 
something we were measuring, let's say our weight, uh, let's say uh, your weight is 52.07, uh, let's say 0, 06 kilograms. And we have two scales, let's say scale one, which uh, measures to the closest half a kilogram or 0.5 kilogram gives our weight as 52 kilograms. And let's say we have a second scale, scale two, which measures to the nearest hundredth, that's the 0 0.01 kilogram, gives our weight as 53.19 kilograms. In this case, with these two scales, we can say that scale one is more accurate. Scale one is off of our uh, weight by only 0 0.06 kilograms, wh whereas uh, scale two is off by 1.13 kilograms. So scale one is more accurate. However, um, scale two has the smaller uh, measurements possible. It measures to the nearest hundredth of a kilogram. So scale two is more precise. It has more detail in its measurements. Uh, now that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Uh, it doesn't have to be true that scale one and scale, uh, that uh, these two measurements um, are different in, in terms of which one is more accurate, which one is more precise. It just so happens in this example that is the case. Okay, so that is question eight. Go back to our study guide here, question nine. So question nine, we're looking at what is the absolute and relative error in the following problem. So in this problem, we have uh, the bathroom scale weigh, uh, says you weigh 145 pounds when you really weigh 138 pounds. And in the review, it says find the relative error, but let's find both the absolute and the relative error in, in these measurements. So this one was question 10. Uh, sorry, nine, <laughs> getting ahead of myself. Question nine. <clears throat> so question nine, we have the true weight is given to us as 138 pounds. And we have the scale measures our weight as 145 pounds. Okay, and what we're doing here is we want to find the absolute error and relative error. So I'm going to abbreviate this just, just for the sake of, of writing. Let's, let's call this absolute error. This is going to be equal to, so the, the, um, the absolute error is always going to be the measured value minus the true value. So in this case, that is uh, 145 minus 138. Now, um, if you can, uh, <laughs> if it's possible for you to, that's fine if you do that in your head. But if not, just use your non-programmable calculator. You know, uh, calculators are allowed in this course, <clears throat> a non-programmable calculator. Uh, so 145 minus 138, we get seven pounds. So seven pounds is the absolute error in this measurement. Okay. For the relative error, and again, I'm just going to abbreviate that relative error is equal to the measured value minus the true value divided by the true value. And relative means that is a percent. So we multiply this by 100 to get this in 2% form. So we'd have 145 minus 138 divided by 138, and this times 100. Okay, so we plug that into our calculator, <clears throat> and let's let's uh, round, let's round in this case to the nearest uh, two decimal places. Uh, even though this is a percent, we can still round to decimal places. We multiply by 100, 
we get 5.07% is the uh, relative error. So again, that, that relative, just as a reminder, the word relative means it is a, a percentage. And so we want it in percent format. Um, and let's see. Now, for, for the final exam, since this is going to be on, on web campus, I will tell you uh, in the problem how many decimal points uh, to round to. Um, but I'll also try to, uh, to program it in so that, that it will give you a little bit of leeway in terms of what you put uh, as your solution. OK, so that was problem nine. Problem 10. Uh, we're looking at compound interest. So you have $10,000 in a savings account that pays 2% APR compounded monthly. You want to find the balance on the account after five years. Now, um, I believe I've said this, but just to reiterate, uh, for the final exam, um, let, me, let me phrase this correctly. For the final exam, I am not going to require you to memorize anything you did not memorize for previous exams. So for uh, test two, if you recall, here is our review for test two. Um, you were given these three equations. That is going to be the case for the final exam. I'm going to give you these three equations. Now it's going to be just as it was on test two. On test two, uh, you're not going to have um, these aren't going to be labeled any further than they are. Uh, you'll have to uh, recognize that the compound interest is this middle equation here, uh, but it will be given to you. Um, on the exam. So you don't have to memorize any equations that you didn't already have to memorize for the previous exam. Um, anything that you did have to have memorized for, memorized for the previous exams, you will have to have memorized for, for, the, uh, for the final. Um, luckily with memory, if you've already memorized it once, rememorizing it if you've forgotten is, is a whole lot easier than memorizing it for the first time. OK, so question 10. Um, sorry, let me just double check, make sure I'm on the right page on the sharing screen here. OK, so question 10. Uh, so we're using the equation that the amount, the compound interest amount is equal to the principal times 1 plus APR over n to the n times y power. OK. Now, uh, in this particular problem, let's, oh, what did I do there? OK. <laughs> Sorry, let me, let me fix that. There we go. Uh, so in this particular problem, we have to identify what, we, what our variables are. So we have the principal amount invested is $10,000. Uh, the APR was given to us as 2%. Now remember, for these problems, when you're using a percent, we want it in decimal form. So we uh, are going to convert that to decimal form. That is 0 0.02 uh, n, the number of times that this is compounded per year. This is compounded monthly, so n is equal to 12. And y, the number of years we are investing this, is five years, so five. So we plug everything into our formula. So we have 10,000 times 1 plus 0 0.02 over 12 to the power of 12 times 5. And uh, here, again, we do have to be careful about how we enter this into the calculator. Um, so just be aware of that. Whenever you have multiple things in the exponent, you have to use parentheses for that. So um, just be aware of that. So you enter this into your uh, calculator. And let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to uh, do that off screen since we have done that in class several times. 12 times 5. Okay. Uh, and because this is a money value, we're going to round to two decimal places since this is a money value. And what you should get is 
and 79 cents. It's a .7892 and continues on. So if you're rounding to two decimal places, that rounds to .79. Okay, so that's question 10. Question 11 is on mortgage payments. Now, um, this one I, I meant to edit uh, on the review. I, I apparently either didn't or saved the wrong copy. Um, but a lot of, uh, I would say probably half of the, not, not half. Uh, some of this problem was already uh, tested on in project two, so I'm not gonna test for it on the final. Um, but let's, let's read through it. I'll, I'll mention what parts are important, what parts are not. Uh, so you decide to buy a house for $130,000. You found a bank that will provide you a loan of 15 years with an APR of 7.5%. That is the important part that, I will, that we will be needing. Uh, down payment and the one point we're not going to worry about, not for the final exam. Uh, what is your monthly payment? So the first question that we're going to answer is what is your monthly payment for this loan? Second, what is the total amount? That should say, uh, what is the total amount of the payment? Um, what percentage of the total amount is interest? That's the third third thing that we're answering. Uh, and then the rest of this, the, um, the uh, closing, um, closing costs. And if you have a job that's $24,000, is this a reasonable mortgage? Uh, that, was, that was tested on during um, uh, project two. So uh, yeah, project two. So I'm not going to be testing on that. Um, okay, so if we go back to our, well, actually while we're here on this, uh, this window. So remember again, that that's going to be one of these three equations, the payment formula is this third equation. So that's the equation we're using on this problem. Okay. So let's write down the equation first. So we have the equation is the payment is equal to the principal amount times APR over N divided by one minus, and we'll have here is one plus APR over N to the power of negative N times Y. And that's our denominator. So that is our payment formula. Now we just have to identify the variables from the question. Um, and this is for the first part, what is your monthly payment? So uh, P, the principal amount that is borrowed in this case is $130,000. That's how much the loan is for since that's how much the house is. Uh, the APR was given to us as 7.5%. And again, we want that in decimal form. So that's 0 0.075. Uh, N, that's the number of payments we make per year. In this case, that is 12 since we are making monthly payments. N is 12. And Y is the uh, term the loan term, how, how many years do we have to pay off the loan? In this case is 15 years. Okay, so we plug everything into our calculator, or sorry, <laughs> plug everything into the equation, and then we'll plug that into our calculator. So we have 130,000 times the APR is 0 0.075 divided by N is 12. And for our denominator, we have one minus parentheses, one plus 0 0.075 over 12 to the uh, negative n was 12 times y is 15. And again, because this is, um, this is in uh, the exponent, we're going to need parentheses here when we plug that into our calculator. Uh, now, uh, when we did this in class, we did this in three steps. So the first step was we did uh, this part of the denominator with the parentheses one plus 0 0.075. Uh, the second part, we did the entire denominator. And the third part was bringing the whole thing into it. Uh, so I'm going to remind, remind you guys how to plug this into your calculator, um, but I'm not going to show that 
plugging that into the calculator since that, again, we, we did that in class um, and, uh, several times in class, actually. Uh, so for one, we'll do parentheses, one plus the 0 0.075 divided by 12 parentheses. And then to the power is either the caret key or the y to the x key, again, depending on your calculator uh, branch. Parentheses, we need the parentheses in this case. Negative 12 times 15 parentheses. That was the first, first part. Uh, the second part, when we're plugging this into our calculator, we do one minus what we got in step one, so one minus the answer, we use the answer key on the calculator. If your calculator, if your brand of calculator does not have the answer key, and I believe I did say this in, in class as well, um, then you'll have to use the memory function on the calculator. You'll store that, what you get in, in, in uh, step one, in the memory of the calculator, and then in, in uh, the second step, you'll recall that from the memory. And then the third part, uh, when we do the entire thing, then you'll do the 130,000 times 0 0.075 divided by 12, and then divided by the answer, what you get from step two. So again, you'll be using the answer key, or if your calculator does not have the answer key, you'll be using the uh, memory function. You'll be saving and then recalling that number into the calculator's memory. Okay, so we plug that into the calculator. And again, I'm going to uh, not show the entire thing of that uh, since we did that in, in class several times. Uh, so what you should get for the monthly payment, what you get when you plug that into the calculator and again, we'll round to the nearest hun uh, hundredth since we're looking at um, a dollar amount. That's uh, two decimal places is 216, uh, sorry, getting ahead of myself. Not 216, uh, $1,205.12. It's uh, 0 0.1160 and so on. So rounding to the nearest uh, two decimal places, we get 0.12. Okay, so that was the first part of the question. Uh, second part, uh, what is the total amount that is paid? So the total amount that we pay for this uh, loan, we take the amount that we're paying monthly, which is $1,205.12. We multiply this by 12 to get the amount that we pay in a year. And remember, uh, this loan is uh, a 15-year loan, so we multiply by 15 years. We plug that into our calculator, and we get twenty-one thousand. Uh, no, uh, two hundred sixteen thousand uh, dollars, nine hundred twenty-one and sixty cents. So that is the total amount that we've paid over the 15 years for this loan. Um, and then the last part, uh, what percentage of that, uh, of this total amount is interest? So in order to answer that first, we need to calculate how much we did pay in interest. So interest is equal to the total amount minus the principal amount that we borrowed. And so in this case, that's $216,921.60 minus the original amount of the loan was $130,000. And so what we get when we take the difference is $86,000. Now that's the total amount paid in interest, but we want that as a percent. How much of the total, what percent of the total was paid in interest? So for the percent, 
paid in interest. If we take the amount we paid in interest, the $86,921.60, we divide by the total amount, which was $216,921.60. And we want to, and this is a percent, so we multiply by 100 to get this into percent form. And for this one, let's round to one decimal place. So you get 40.705, uh, sorry, 40.0705. And so rounded to the nearest percent, uh, tenth of a percent is 40.1. So 40.1% of the amount that we paid over the lifetime of this loan was paid in interest. Okay, uh, back to our review. So that was 11. Question 12, we're looking at correlation. Um, so we're given a scatter plot. Uh, first, identify the two variables being uh, compared. Uh, discuss the potential correlation between these variables. So we're, here we're looking at, is this a strong or weak correlation? Is this a negative or positive correlation? And here we're going to use the correlation coefficient that is given. Um, and the rest of that we don't need to worry about. Um, so the first part, identify the two variables being compared. So for that, we look at the, y, the x and the y axis on our uh, scatter plot. The y-axis here is average size in acres. And the x-axis is the number of farms measured in millions. So uh, here would be 1 million, here would be 2 million, 3 million, and so on. Uh, so the two variables being compared is the, av is the uh, size of the farm in acres uh, versus the number of farms in the millions. Uh, next, the correlation. So let's, let's um, Looking at this, there we can see there is a correlation since the the uh, scatter plots the points aren't all over the place. There is a correlation here, um, and if you recall, uh, when we read this going left to right, if the value is going up, then it's increasing, so it's a positive correlation. If it's going down, then it's decreasing, it's a negative correlation. And going from going from left to right here, uh, we see the the values are going down, so this is a negative correlation. Uh, next, we want to we want to determine whether it's strong or weak. So we're using the uh, correlation coefficient, which is this one, uh, the point uh, zero point eight three seven one. Um, for the purposes of this class, uh, this is not entirely accurate. But for this class, for this this particular class, this is sufficient. Uh, you can think of the correlation coefficient as a percent. Now that's that's a very big oversimplification, but for this class, that's fine. Um, if, you know, in this case, we would think of the correlation as 83.71%. Uh, and anything that is greater than 50%, we're going to say is a strong correlation. Anything under 50% is a weak correlation. So in this case, uh, because this is over 50, over the 0.5, then this is a strong correlation. So we can say this is a strong negative correlation. Okay, so that's 12. Question 13. Uh, so 13, we're looking at a distribution. Uh, 1,000 students uh, took an exam. And the results for that, the median for the exam was 87%. The mean was 92%. The low was 24. The high was 98. We want to know is is this symmetric, uh, skewed right or left? If it is not symmetric, is it a high variation or a low variation in the data? Okay, so let's go to our digital paper here, and let's see. We should have some enough room here. So for thirteen, uh, let's. Let's kind of try to draw our distribution from the information that we have. Okay, so we have scores from zero to 100. Um, the low score 
was a 24. So I'm going to going to try and draw this part like a box plot. So here was 24. That's the low. The high score was a 98. Uh, so here is the high score, which is a 98. Again, since I'm trying to draw this as a box plot, that's Uh, that's more or less what our box plot would look like, or at least the beginning of the box plot. The median was 87. Uh, let me get the right value here. 87 is right here. This is the median. It was at an 87. So the median is pretty high. And the mean, let's put that here, the mean was a 92, which is right about here. This is our mean. Now, looking at, at this, so um, again, our median is our halfway point of the data point. So half of the data points are between 24 and 87. And the other half of the data points are between 87 and 98. That is what the median tells us. Um, so half of our data is right here, kind of bunched up at the top. So to, when we when we draw this distribution, when we graph this distribution, it, so, it should look something like this. And so uh, it's not symmetric. If it was symmetric, then uh, two things would happen. The first thing is that the median would be the halfway point between 24 and 100, and it is not. And the median and the mean would be the same, which they are not. So if it was symmetric, those two things would occur. Neither of those occur, so we can say it's not symmetric. Uh, and in this case, our outliers, it looks like are right here on the left side of the graph. So we can say this is left skewed. Okay. Next. Um, what is the variation? Is, is there a high variation or a low variation? Uh, in this case, Again, half of our data points are between 87 and 98. So uh, that's already uh, an indication of kind of the spread of our data. Remember, the variation is a measure of how spread out our data is. And the mean is 92, which means that um, a lot of the lower scores would have to be close to, to uh, 87, would have to be close here. Otherwise, the mean would be much lower than 92. So most of our data points are kind of bunched up in this, in this area of the graph, which means that most of our data points are within this small range. Because we have a small range, we have a low spread, so we have a low variation. If the data points were more spread out, if the mean was lower, then we would have a higher variation but because all of the data points are, are kind of smushed together on the right side of this, of this uh, distribution, which we can see from the, um, from the median and the mean of the data, then we have a low variation. The data points are not spread uh, out very much. They're all kind of grouped together, so low variation. That was question 13. Uh, question 14, we're looking at our box plots. Um, so just as a reminder of our box plots, I'm going to, let's look at the uh, bottom box plot here since that's a little bit uh, easier to read in terms of, of the, the graph. Uh, so the, uh, the left endpoint, between the left endpoint and the left side of the box is a fourth of our data. Between the left side of our box and the middle of our box is a fourth of the data. From the middle of the box to the right side of the box is a fourth of our data. 
and from the right side of the box and the right endpoint is a fourth of our data. So this uh, cuts our data into fourths. Okay, now let's look at what the question is asking. So uh, we're having a, a hypothetical situation where you are an instructor, a teacher, and you have a Tuesday, Thursday class and a Monday, Wednesday class. And a student from your Tuesday, Thursday class, uh, you've heard a student from, from your Tuesday, Thursday class got a sneak uh, copy of the test that you were given to your Monday, Wednesday class. You want to determine whether this is true or not using the box plot. Uh, so here at the, the bottom box plot is the Monday, Wednesday course. The top one is the Tuesday, Thursday course. So it should, it should probably be labeled a little bit better. Um, notice for the bottom box plot, the data is spread out uh, relatively evenly, more, more evenly than the first one. Um, it looks like half of our data is between a 78 and a 100. So that's half of our data. For the uh, top box plot, the Tuesday, Thursday class, it looks like that um, the median here corresponds with the left side of the box. So we can say that about 3 fourths of our data is between a 78 and 100. But um, what's even more interesting is the right side of the, of the box plot here, the right side of the box plot it looks like this is around at a 98 to a 100, that a fourth of our, fourth of our data points are between 98 and 100. Uh, so this indicates that it might be likely that the Tuesday, Thursday class received a sneak copy of the exam. And again, that's not, that's not necessarily proof that that has occurred, but it is an indication that that uh, may have been the case. So that is question 14. Uh, question 15, we're not doing standard deviation, uh, calculating that by hand, so don't worry about that. Question 16, we're looking at uh, normal distributions. We have a set of infinite weights as normally distributed with a mean of five, I should say, pounds and a standard devi deviation of one pound. Uh, we want to use the 96, uh, sorry, <laughs> I always, always mess that up, the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. Um, and find the percentage of infants that weigh more than six pounds. And then, um, so that first first part, let's let's do the whole rule. So we're looking at the whole uh, 68, 95, uh, 99.7 rule. And then um, how much weigh more than six pounds? So there's two questions on that rule. And then the second part is if we have a weight of seven pounds, what is the standard score for that infant? Okay. So this is kind of a two-step, two-step problem there. So for let's let's get a, a fresh page for this one. Okay. Uh, so this one was question 16. So we have a normal distribution. We have the mean is five pounds. And the standard deviation is one pound. Okay, so the 68, uh, 95, 97.7 rule, the 68% of our data points, so of the weights, are within one standard deviation of the mean. Uh, so our between, we take our mean which is five, and we subtract one standard deviation, which is one pound, and we take our mean, which is five, and we add one standard deviation, which, which is one pound. Uh, and so in this case, we get uh, between four pounds and six pounds. The next part, 95% uh, of the weight is within two standard deviations. So we do five minus two, times the standard deviation, which is one pound, and five plus two times the standard deviation. So is between uh, five minus two times one and five plus two times one. So we get that's between three and uh, seven pounds. And the last part of the rule, 97.7% of the weights we add and subtract three standard deviations. So five minus three times one and five plus three times one. 
So we get between two and eight pounds. So this part right here that I have, oops, if my mouse would work, sorry, uh, that I have circled is that rule, the 68, 95, 97.7 rule. So you should be able to calculate that. Uh, the next part of that is uh, we want to find the percentage of infants that weigh more than six pounds. Notice that six pounds is here. So if we were to graph this distribution, um, let me go closer here. If we were to graph this distribution, we'd have our normal curve. And here would be four pounds. Here would be six pounds. And this part would have 68% of our data points, which means that 32% is what's left on the bottom and uh, top halves. Or not halves, but you, you, you know what I mean. Um, so here, this is 32 over 2% of the data points. And likewise here, there's 32 over 2% of the data points, which will add to 100. So we can say uh, 32 divided by two, which is 16% of the weights are more than six pounds. And then we want to know what is the standard score or the z-score for a weight of seven pounds. So the z-score, we take the data value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So in this case, our data value is seven minus the mean was five, divided by the standard deviation is one, so we get two. So in this case, the z-score is two, which tells us that uh, this weight is two standard deviations above the mean. Okay, so that was 16. Uh, 17, we're looking at theoretical probability of drawing a face card, uh, Jack, which is uh, given to us as a jack, queen, or king, from a standard, uh, that should say 52 card deck, okay? So when we're looking at probability, uh, so this one is 17, so the probability of drawing a face card we have is a jack, a queen, or a king, so the probability of this is going to be something over 52 because there are 52 cards available. Now, um, for this, there are three face cards per suit. Jack, king, uh, jack, queen, king. That's what we're told. The jack, queen, king, those are the face cards. We have three of those per suit. And in our 52 card deck, if you recall, we have four suits. We have uh, the spades, the clubs, the diamonds, the hearts. So each one of those has three face cards. So that's four times three is 12 face cards. And let's give this as a percent. Uh, since this is going to be on the exam, I'll probably uh, ask you for what is the percent of this. So uh, we find the decimal times by 100. Um, so you get the probability is 12 over 52 or a 23 point zero seven percent chance of drawing a face card. Okay. Um, now for the sake of time, I think I'm going to stop there. The 18, uh, 19 and 20 are uh, from chapters eight and nine, which we went over rel uh, relatively recently. 18 was a linear equation. 19 is either half-life or doubling time. In this particular example, this doubles every 11 minutes, so that's doubling time. 
And in 20, it's an exponential model that does not have half-life or double time. It has the uh, percent change, which is 10%. So that's our third equation. Remember, we had three equations for uh, exponential, exponential growth or decay. OK. Um, so and that's our review. Uh, and I will be sending out an email here shortly, uh, reminding you guys about the final exam. Uh, the final exam we're going to have, let me uh, switch back. The final exam we are going to have on web campus. Uh, Pearson had a few issues that I don't really care to repeat for, <laughs> for the final exam. So we're going to have the final exam on web campus. Um, and this will be in the emails, but just to reiterate, um, just as, as if you were taking this in class, uh, you should write down your steps, you know, write down the problem, write down your steps, uh, show your work in doing the problem, just as if you were do it, doing the exam in class. And then for any of the questions that you miss, uh, send me your scratch paper for the final exam. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, thank you for your patience. I apologize. I have no idea why my computer uh, crashed this morning during lecture. I don't know why it was doing that. It seems to be fine now which is usually the case. Usually it seems to work fine when you don't need it. Um, but I apologize for that. Um, I'm going to be uploading this as soon as uh, the video compiles. And uh, I will be sending out the email for the final. So again, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your uh, participation in this, in this, uh, in this class. And uh, I, I wish you a, a good rest of the semester.